Okay, so uh, welcome everybody on Zoom and on Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to just shortly begin our webinar about studying the liberal arts. We have today with us Charles Harcourt from Wells College, Jake Sisko from Wellesley College, and Jennifer Russell from Bryn Mawr College. Um, please, uh, if you're on Zoom, use the Q&A box to ask any questions. We won't entertain questions in the chat box. And if you're joining us on Facebook, please uh, drop a comment. We will pick it up. Um, as they go. Uh, so over to you guys, and thank you so much for joining us. Great, so I guess we can go ahead and get started um, just to kind of um, kick things off. I want to introduce myself. My name is Jake Sisko. I'm an assistant director of admission at Wellesley. Um, I cover South Asia, Latin and South America, and other domestic territories. Well, we wanted to start off by giving you a little bit of history as to kind of why the liberal arts exist and where they originated. Um, for some reason, a lot of students seem to think that there's like a political tinge because of the name liberal arts, um, where they think that because it's called liberal arts, it does not include science. And so we kind of wanted to assuage some of those anxieties or stereotypes um, to give you some, some information. It actually comes from ancient Rome, and, and the original term uh, is actually derived from Latin. It essentially means that it refers to a list of skills or subjects that were expected um, or deemed essential knowledge for a free citizen. So if you were um, meant to engage critically as a citizen of the Roman Empire, then you had to have these skills to actually hold these conversations, right? Um, again, as the slide says, it would include things like being able to participate in public debates, to really get the most out of military service, and especially to serve on a jury in a criminal court. They would expect you to have um, kind of this background in education. At the time, some of the core subjects included things like rhetoric, grammar, and logic, but it really extended far beyond that as well into courses like physics, astronomy, um, and, and really all kinds of a, a broad base of knowledge um, to make someone a very well-rounded citizen of the world. But as when it comes to the kind of American version, um, they really started with our first founded college, which of course is Harvard in 1636. And at the time, Harvard was modeled after Cambridge and Oxford, again, in this liberal arts kind of mode. It was a broad-based curriculum, right? So most schools at the time, what we call colonial colleges now, were broad-based, um, again, with a wide range of interests. They wanted to, um, you know, again, ensure that students would be well-rounded once they entered the real world, that scientists could write, and that humanities scholars could still discuss things like economics and physics and biology. Um, unfortunately, for the first few centuries, these colleges really were restricted to white men with a pretty considerable amount of money. Um, as you can see on the left, in the 19th century, typically after 1850 or so, um, was when you started to see the first schools accept not only female students, but also students of color and students coming from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who weren't necessarily kind of um, wealthier families, but could maybe, you know, work at the college or find other uh, attempts or, or modes of financial support in order to afford the education itself. Now, at the same time, a lot of these schools that were originally founded as liberal arts started to shift a, toward um, what we call research institutions. So not to bore you too much, but the German model really kind of um, took off in the mid 19th century with schools like Johns Hopkins, University of Chicago. And then a lot of these schools that were originally considered liberal arts like the Ivy League, including Harvard, really shifted away from this model and towards this kind of broader based research institution with multiple schools, um, graduate programs, including law schools, medical schools, etc. And so the focus really shifted away from that undergraduate experience. But liberal arts colleges today still hold true to that original curriculum, right? And many of us refer to them as actual liberal arts and sciences colleges, so that students do realize that you're not going to get, you know, a degree in painting. You're not going to study, you know, the history of sculpture 
really you're going to be there to focus on a very broad based curriculum again so that you can be a well-rounded uh, citizen but once you kind of declare your major or your concentration that's where you really start to get that in-depth training in specific academic disciplines um, to be honest, even though many universities are no longer liberal arts colleges, their undergraduate curriculum is still based on that model. And so even if you go to um, you know, a larger institution, maybe 12, 13, 14,000 students on campus, that undergraduate model, they're still going to expect you to take classes from multiple academic departments before you truly um, kind of start to hone in on one or two specific majors that interest you. And for those of you who aren't as uh, aware of how American high schools are structured, most of them also have a very similar approach, right? You are going to be required to spend a certain amount of time in English classes, math classes, the social sciences, the natural and physical sciences, and then of course, a language other than English. And so it's not for American and domestic students, it's not a huge kind of jump from going to an American high school to attending a liberal arts college. It's a very similar structure. It's the research institutions um, that are much larger typically and have very, very different um, kind of ways of approaching this process. Okay, so I'm gonna take over here and talk about some more uh, concrete aspects of the academics, uh, the academic features of liberal arts and um, my name is Charlie Harcourt. I'm the International Recruitment and Operations Coordinator uh, for Wells College, which is located right near Ithaca, New York. Um, and I, I basically cover anything involving international students from your, the first contact with Wells all the way through uh, the visa process and campus arrival. So I've got a, basically a one-person office for international students. Uh, so, with these uh, with these academic aspects of liberal arts, I'm especially going to focus more on the features of a small liberal arts college uh, and the features of, of colleges that focus on undergraduate, which is true for uh, all three of the institutions we're representing today. So, a big aspect that Jake alluded to is uh, that the liberal arts really focus on some of those soft skills that not only make you uh, make your academics stronger, make you a better student, but will actually make you a more engaged citizen, will, will help you to uh, approach any kind of problems, any kind of job, career, and generally your own life uh, in a more meaningful way, in a more thoughtful way. Um, and some of those, ex uh, some examples include uh, learning how to think critically uh, and creatively, especially when it comes to problem solving. Uh, a lot of what liberal arts education is focused on is identifying issues, contemporary political issues or, or problems, and then working together uh, to think critically and come up with solutions. Uh, this process usually follows inquiry and analysis where with, in the classroom you're always asking questions, you're analyzing resources and trying to come up with new ideas. So it's not just a, definitely not a, a memorization type of curriculum. Uh, you, it's an active curriculum. Uh, you definitely uh, develop very strong writing and oral skills because you're always engaged in the classroom um, and because you're going to engage in, in a lot of writing um, in different forms, not just research writing, but a lot of different forms. Those skills are, are, are built very well through a liberal arts curriculum. I mentioned solving problems. And then a, a really big aspect that's relevant to uh, each of our institution's diversity mission and the reason why we work so hard to bring international students to our campuses, it's uh, liberal arts also focuses on developing the ability to understand all kinds of different perspectives, different views, um, to learn to appreciate cultural di diversity and learn how people live all around the world. Um, so all of those are some of the essential skills of liberal arts. We can go to the next. Okay, uh, so in the liberal arts, uh, in the liberal arts college, in the actual classroom, uh, it's going to look a little bit differently than what you would see in a large research university. 
Uh, it's much more rare at a liberal arts college to have large lecture style classes where a professor is or a graduate assistant is just delivering information and you're collecting it through notes um, and then maybe taking tests. That's not what liberal arts is about at all. Uh, it's really about getting active in the classroom, engaging in discussion, uh, and learning to communicate effectively with others. You may find yourself even debating with a professor and that is okay in a liberal arts uh, style classroom. It's, it's all about the discussion and inquiry and engagement. Uh, oftentimes in, in classes through a liberal arts curriculum, uh, the learning is applied to real world problems in, in real time. So you may be developing um, some type of a, an action plan to, to address a contemporary issue that may have just come up in the news this week. Uh, th that, that can happen in a liberal arts curriculum. Um, we wanna make sure that what you're learning and the skills you're building is applied to the world around you, that it doesn't live in isolation on an academic campus, um, but is actually going to help you to engage, um, to be a better citizen, and to, to really thrive in the real world. Uh, many small liberal arts colleges also encourage their students to get very involved in the local community because that develops a whole different type of skills as well as uh, develops a habit and commitment to serving others and to leading in a community, uh, to engaging with people who are different from yourself, um, and to pursuing those ideals of, of social justice um, and of community resilience and sustainability. All of those are aspects that make the, the education much more active and dynamic than your, your typical lecture style kind of class. You can go to the next one. Okay, uh, and another one that Jake, Jake alluded to uh, is that the liberal arts, especially the arts part of it, uh, can sometimes throw students off and think that it's focused on visual arts. And that's really not, not true for most uh, liberal arts colleges. Uh, our students study a really wide range of different topics as far as their majors and their uh, elective courses. Um, for example, with Wells, some of our top majors are actually Bachelor of Science. Uh, we have very strong programs in health sciences, in business. Um, we have computer science major. So even though the approach is liberal arts, um, some of the majors, some of the top majors at a lot of liberal arts colleges are science and technology majors. Um, it's more about the, the active, engaged, and interdisciplinary approach to that education, no matter what you're studying. So you will still focus on a major. So you choose one subject or discipline that, that will be your focus throughout your education. You'll graduate with that major. But uh, all liberal arts colleges afford students a lot of freedom within their curriculum to take a wide variety of classes. And many liberal arts colleges actually require you to take a wide variety of classes. So on our, on our campus, even though students choose a major and the major may have some, some more rigid requirements, uh, students also have to take courses in social perspectives and visual arts and history and literature um, and social science and lab sciences. So throughout the four years that you would attend a school like Wells or Wellesley or Bryn Mawr, you'd be exposed to, um, to many different subjects at, at the college level. Um, and coursework sometimes is interconnected across disciplines. So we have a lot of courses that don't necessarily fit into one category. Uh, you may be engaged in many different disciplines um, and some, some courses actually have collaborative aspects to them across different disciplines. Uh, we can go ahead to the next one. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how uh, how the liberal arts curriculum, especially at a smaller undergraduate focused college is individualized. And uh, I thought the best way to do this would be to actually focus on a story of an actual student um, and what the kind of liberal arts curriculum has provided to her. So uh, this is a student I worked very closely with at Wells College. Her name is Patience Kinnig. And she came to Wells originally from Liberia in in Western Africa uh, through a program called Smart Liberia. Uh, she 
achieved a scholarship to Wales partially because of her involvement in community service um, and because she had actually started her own small business before even, even uh, attending college. It was called PK House of Cocoa. Uh, her parents ran a cocoa plantation uh, farm and she saw that uh, they could really maximize their value if they turn that product, the cocoa, into uh, into into products that could be sold for, sold for consumption, like chocolate or hot cocoa or different bath and body body products. So she started that business and still kind of runs it from halfway around the world now. But uh, since she's been at Wells. Uh, she has decided to pursue a double major, which is a very big undertaking, but it is possible at many liberal arts schools. Uh, and it kind of showcases that interdisciplinary aspect. So she's studying environmental science and business because she wants to continue her work in, uh, she wants to continue the, the work focused on bringing agriculture to market in, in creative ways. Uh, she's been very involved on campus and through community service in many clubs. And then the most impressive part is that uh, is how the individualized faculty mentorship from her professors has led to some pretty amazing opportunities. Uh, she came up with this idea in one of her courses to turn uh, the like large metal shipping containers into solar powered coolers uh, for rural agriculture so that when farmers had their um, when they had their crops and they were um, the crops that they yield for, you know from the farms uh, to ensure that those crops would not go bad before they could bring them to market, she wanted to uh, provide these remote solar coolers. Um, she worked with a faculty member throughout uh, previous summer to kind of develop this idea into a full business plan. Uh, she pitched that business plan uh, through at Wells through a contest called Be Your Own Boss. Uh, she won that contest at Wells. Uh, she went on to a much larger contest that included graduate students at Syracuse, placed uh, third place. And then she took that business plan and some of the seed money she had won to develop the idea even further. And then just recently at the UN Youth Assembly Global Impact Challenge, uh, she, she won for sustainable development um, among you know, there's hundreds of, of, of applicants from all over the world, graduate students, undergraduate students, and her idea for PK Eco Storage with the solar containers um, actually won her a significant grant and mentorship from the UN Youth Assembly. So, so that's just an example of how that individualized attention from professors, you know, the interdisciplinary academics, um, and all of the opportunities at a liberal arts school can, can lead to some really amazing things. Okay. All right, so hi, I'm, I'm Jennifer Russell and I am representing Bryn Mawr College. I'm an associate director there and um, coordinate international recruitment. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about things that are non-curricular or maybe co-curricular um, at a liberal arts and sciences college and starting off with residential life. I think that's one of the things that people think of first and foremost about um, a, a small college and the residential life aspect of that. Um, so at most colleges, uh, liberal arts and sciences colleges, students live on or near campus um, um, in dorms, as, as probably you know. Um, this gives students access to people and facilities 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this means access to friends, obviously. It means access to faculty members, um, I'm, you know, faculty, are not just a nine to five job, but they're certainly connecting with students um, at other times as well. Um, but this also means um, that you have access to dining services, for example, food is very important. Um, health services, for example. Um, so, you know, all sorts of things that make this a, a home and your community. Um, and you'll hear us talk quite a bit about the sense of community because that is so important. Um, I also wanted to highlight self-government. So some of your high schools may, you know, have student government associations and that sort of thing certainly continues at, at college. 
and oftentimes to a much wider degree, um, students are really, um, you know, making a lot of their own decisions and collaborating with each other. And this can be for things like decorations in a dorm, um, but it could be things like, you know, campus committees or academic committees that students are participating in, um, or more substantial things, you know, sort of that, that are part of the campus life. So those are, are a couple of the things that I wanted to highlight. So just for fun, um, you know, I think people think about the actual dorm room oftentimes. <laughs> and so I would thought I would just show a little bit of our project dorm room. So this is a competition that, that happens every year and students decorate and compete for, um, for their dorm decor. So I thought I would just share that just for fun so you can get a, a little bit of a picture of, of what an actual dorm room looks like. Next slide. And so also students, you know, certainly think at uh, a liberal arts and sciences college about the extracurricular activities that are happening, clubs and organizations um, that are, you know, some of them may be things that you have done in high school that you want to continue to do, and some may be brand new, and that's the the fun and exciting part of getting a chance to try something new um, at, at college. And I've, you know, I've listed a couple of the different kinds of organizations and clubs. Um, athletics certainly is alive and well at our schools. Um, it looks, it's, you're not going to see us playing football on ESPN. Um, most liberal arts colleges are not at that level. Um, but we have very strong athletic programs where you can really make a difference and make an impact. Um, and that's true not only with athletics, but with, you know, all sorts of clubs and activities because you're really making an impact. You're really part of this community. Um, so I, I wanted to highlight um, this. So you may notice a kind of a fun picture in the upper right uh, corner there of some superheroes. So next slide. Um, so here's a close up. And this is not Halloween, actually. So I wanted, I, this is just a fun way of kind of talking a little bit about the community. Um, so we have um, a end of the semester feast, basically every year with a different theme. And this particular theme um, was the DC Comics versus the Marvel Comics characters. And these are not students dressed up. Um, these are faculty and staff and administrators um, that are part of this whole event. Um, and I highlight this because, again, when you're in a community, everybody can participate. And that doesn't just mean students on campus. That means, you know, all, all of your faculty, staff, and, and um, um, you know, other mentors that, that may be on campus. Um, and hidden in this picture um, are several deans, um, the director of our health center, and our college president is in here. <laughs> so I'll let you decide which one she might be. So again, just a kind of a fun way of highlighting what you can really bring together with extra extracurricular activities, you know, when students are living re residentially in a place. Um, so some of the fun, thing, the, the fun things that can, that can happen. Next slide. And then uh, finally, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, all of these connections that you've made while you're on campus um, continue for the rest of your life. Um, the, really hard to describe the kinds of connections that um, with friends and with, you know, faculty members that you continue, um, you know, way beyond your four years at college. Uh, they're very strong alumni creation, uh, alumni relations, um, connections that you make really for the, again, for the, the, re the rest of your life, um, both personal and professional. Um, so I highlighted a little Facebook group there that you can see that is a collection of um, women's colleges alumni. And they have a Facebook group, huge in numbers. And these are alums that 
connect about all sorts of things. It could be for something very professional, someone looking for an internship. Um, but as you can see there, it could be someone looking for housing. <laughs> you know, hey, I'm an alum in your city. Can I, you know, do you have someplace that, that, um, that I could stay? Um, or I thought it was interesting, somebody was looking for a certified financial planner. So these are, you know, grown-ups with grown-up jobs and have been out of college for a while, but are still connecting on all sorts of personal and professional kinds of ways. Next slide. And imagine, it could be 50 years <laughs> in your future, um, but these kinds of scenes really do happen. And again, these connections for life um, among these people that you're spending these four years with. And so just wanted to highlight that kind of as a, um, as something to tug at your heart. <laughs> and go ahead, thank you. Oh, right, okay. So to tie all these um, kind of factors up, I wanted to highlight also the holistic aspect of the admissions process. So all three of us have talked about some of the academic factors that are part of, you know, your experience at a liberal arts college, um, you know, the personal kinds of things, what you're doing, um, clubs and activities, your experience. And so all of these things are things that we look at in the, um, in the, in the application process. So, um, so, because the reason is because you're not just a student. You're not just a student in a classroom. Um, you are somebody's roommate. <laughs> you're playing on the basketball team or you're writing for the newspaper. You're doing a lot of things on campus and you're not just a student studying. So we want to get that full picture of you. So yes, we are going to look at academic, your academic um, criteria, grades, test scores, intellectual engagement, those kinds of things, what your teachers say about you. Um, but then we also you know, ask you to write those essays. Um, we ask um, you know, what you're doing in your free time, your extracurricular activities. Um, some of us um, may, probably none of us require interviews, but it's another um, possibility um, and just a way for you to share kind of who, um, who you are with us. And then there's sort of this overall fit uh, that's a little bit hard to describe, but you know, we wanna make sure that you are a good match for our institution and vice versa, you know, that, that this is really a good fit for you. And so ultimately, when we're looking at applications and reviewing students, um, you know, we want all of these things to, to fit together. So there's a tiny little section in the, middle of those three circles um, that it, ideally we're aiming for, but, um, but um, you know, sort of the, the collection of, uh, of students on campus um, make up what that, that, those three circles. So not everybody is gonna be obviously in the center of that, um, but we're kind of um, curating, I guess is maybe the word, I, curating a class and curating all these interesting and unique people that are gonna be a good fit and a good part of our community. Uh, so I think, yep, that is the end of sort of the general, general section. Um, and we're each gonna spend a little bit of time in this order just highlighting our own institutions so you can hear a little bit more about them. Great, so I'm gonna start off with Wells College. Um, and you could take a, a second to soak in this picture, but this is uh, Cayuga Lake Wells. The whole campus is right along Cayuga Lake, which is part of the Finger Lakes. Uh, and this is the college boathouse where students go when it's nice out, hang out on the dock. Um, there's swimming in the summer and all kinds of things related to the lake. But let's go ahead to the next one. So, uh, so our location, we're in a, a fairly small town. Uh, it's a rural town called Aurora, sort of like a vacation spot for people in the area. Um, but we're, we're about 20 minutes from Ithaca and Ithaca, you may know, is where Cornell University is. So there's really amazing resources. There's all kinds of different food and shopping in Ithaca and we collaborate really well with Cornell and Ithaca College for, for programs um, and even uh, for, for courses as well. 
Uh, so Wells was actually founded about 150 years ago as a sister school to Cornell. Um, Henry Wells and Ezra Cornell were, were friends uh, back in the, the 1850s. So, uh, but, but since then, Wells has really maintained its focus on being a small, uh, dedicated community focused on liberal arts. Uh, Wells is co-ed, which I, I do want to highlight because our other two institutions um, on today are, are women's colleges. So Wells started as a women's college, but we've been co-ed for about 20 years. Um, so men and women on campus. Um, I mentioned the beautiful campus along Cayuga Lake. We're, we are quite small, so it's a student body, uh, just under 600 students. So our each incoming class is, I think we have 165 right now coming in. So it's a very small class, definitely feels like a community. Um, you know most of your peers, you know all of your professors by first name. Um, you'll, you know, by the end, time you graduate, you'll know probably everyone in your class. So if you're looking for that kind of a community feel, it's definitely a great spot for that. Uh, we, we're also fairly close and easy access from international airports in Syracuse and Rochester, uh, as well as New York City. There's bus access um, and shuttle services for some of that. Um, and, and I would also highlight that by, by being in a small town and a community focused campus, it's very safe. Um, and like we, we really don't have, well, Aurora doesn't have any significant crime happening at all. Um, so if that's something that I know a lot of parents and students are worried about when they read news about things going on in the U.S., um, small town liberal arts campus is, uh, it might be a good place to be. <laughs> we, we don't have, you know, we don't have any COVID cases right now, um, active in, in Aurora and, uh, and it's, yeah, it's definitely a safe, relaxing space. We can go to the next one. Um, for academics, I mentioned that even though we are liberal arts, some of our pro top programs are focused more on sciences and pre-professional. So business is number one for international students, has a really high job placement rate based on the, the two-year graduate survey. Um, all business majors complete two full-term professional internships. So you, in addition to all that time you spend on campus, uh, you, have, you have the opportunity to get some really strong professional level experience as well. And that those internships do not have to happen near campus. Uh, we have, I have an international student completing his right now in Australia, but mo most students will do it um, in Syracuse or in New York City. We've had students on Wall Street or, or we have one right now with Liberty Mutual in Boston. So a lot of options with those professional internships and you'll get mentorship right from your faculty members and our career office to help you attain uh, your top internships and then jobs once you graduate. Uh, psychology is our largest major overall. Um, it's probably what we're most well known for in the region. Uh, we've been doing psychology at Wells for over 100 years. So it was one of the first um, psychology majors kind of right at the brink of that field emerging in the early 1900s. Um, bi biology and health sciences. The health science program is, is fairly new, but it's really taken off as a, a strong major. Um, we make sure to provide those students with a really strong uh, level of, of professional level research where their students are working directly with faculty on research projects. We have students um, who will be doing research in genetics over the summer. Um, but that's a great program for a variety of different health sciences disciplines. So we have uh, Almost every year we have graduates going into the, vet, the veterinary science program at Cornell, which is very well known. Uh, we have other partnerships for, for nursing and pharmacy with top tier research universities. Um, and then we always have very strong programs in arts and theater, uh, where you get a lot of exposure, you get automatic studio time, or um, you'll, you know, you'll be placed into our productions right away as freshmen. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so rankings, I'm not going to focus too much on this. We're kind of like upper middle ranked liberal arts college. Um, but the ones that I, I'm especially proud of, and I think that uh, that matter a lot, is that we were ranked last year number 14 for social mobility among national liberal arts colleges. And that means that where our students start from their families as far as their um, 
you know, their families, financials, and 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 uh, social situation. Our stu our graduates are making more money and are showing to be more successful than whatever their background is, the background they came from. So it's a it's a little bit confusing, but it basically means that a Wells education will bring you forward. I saw a lot of questions in the Q and A about, uh, you know, will I get a job? All of that. Um, and that ranking shows you that with it, with an education like the one provided at Wells, you can really rise up in in the world, get a get a good job, um, and become even more financially independent than than your family or your upbringing. Um, and then we we're number forty four out of out of almost seven hundred for uh, diversity and inclusion. So right now we're about forty percent of our population are are international or students of color. So um, only about 5% international, but 40% non-white uh, students from all kinds of different backgrounds, ethnicities, um, races, and nationalities. Cool. We can go to the next one. Uh, we got a really good campus overview earlier as far as like the um, community feel, but it's just important to, to note that at Wells and at liberal arts colleges, we do have athletics. We're NCAA Division Three. Um, for Wells, we have a brand new student center that was open last year. We have free trips and transportation every day, three times a day into Ithaca, um, five times a day uh, on weekends. So when you need to go shopping or anything, um, there will be free transportation for you. Health services are available directly on campus. Security is on 24 hours and we have employment options on campus uh, for international students. So let's go to the, the last one. Okay, and because we are undergraduate only, and we are a very small college, we understand that we can't necessarily provide everything you want to get out of your education um, just within our own courses and our own campus. Uh, so we have some really strong partnerships. Um, a big one is, is cross-registration with Cornell University and Ithaca College. So you can take up to one course per year through Cornell or Ithaca, um, as long as it's a course that's not already offered at Wells, which really, you know, Cornell is gigantic, Wells is small, so you have tons of options, um, especially upper level science courses uh, or any kind of specialty languages. I had a student um, who was doing a study abroad program in China. Uh, she's from Nepal and she wanted to take some Mandarin before doing the study abroad program, even though it was in, in English. Uh, so we didn't offer Mandarin at at Wells, so she did that course at Cornell. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, we have a partnership with Columbia University for Engineering. So if you do three years in physics or mathematics at Wells, uh, you can direct transfer into the engineering school, um, into an engineering discipline of your choice at Columbia um, for an additional two years, and you get both degrees. Both are bachelor's degrees, but you'd have a bachelor's degree in physics from Wells and a bachelor's degree in an engineering field from Columbia. Uh, we have a direct program into University of Rochester for nursing. It can be either one or two additional years, depending on the certification you want to achieve there. Um, we have a, a one-year MBA agreement with, with Clarkson. If you do business at Wells, you can go on to Clarkson to get the MBA in just one year. Um, and then one that's not on here is we have uh, with Binghamton, Binghamton University, we have a partnership with their pharmacy school. So you can get a direct transfer into um, the University of Binghamton, which is uh, the top ranked SUNY campus. Um, and that's if you do health science at Wells, you can go into pharmacy at Binghamton. So I think that covers everything for me. Great, so we're gonna kind of kick things off uh, at Wellesley with our central mission statement, which is incredibly easy for people to remember. It's to provide an excellent liberal arts education um, for women who will make a difference in the world. So as Charlie alluded to earlier, both uh, Wellesley and Bryn Mawr are women's colleges. And that means that our undergraduate population is entirely women. So just under 2,400 students representing 50 states and 83 countries. That means that for our breakdown, it's gonna be about half students who identify uh, as people of color, uh, about 16% international students, 
17% uh, of our students are the first generation in their family to attend college at all. And so we are looking at diversity in so many different ways. It's not just about where you're from um, or what you look like. The diversity of our student body is counted in a multitude of factors. And so we're really kind of wanting to, as uh, my colleagues kind of alluded to earlier, bring together this global community, this intentional residential community so that students can learn from each other, both inside the classroom and out. When it comes to our financial aid, I know that's a little bit difficult to read, but we do want students to realize that nearly 60% of students receive financial aid on campus. Um, for all of our domestic applicants, we are need blind. For our international students, we are need aware. And so to kind of quickly explain the difference between those two, it means that um, essentially for uh, US citizens, permanent residents, DACA students, and undocumented students living in the States, we do not consider your ability to pay as a factor in this process. Um, and so it is not um, in any way uh, contributed to the conversation. We essentially don't talk about it. Now for international students, we do have aid available, but it is more limited. And so we will discuss um, the student's ability to pay or their need in the process. Um, but it's rarely ever the determining factor on whether or not we're going to accept a student. Typically, it is a very, very strong cohort of students, including many uh, from Pakistan and India. And so we will have, um, like I said, a fair amount of money kind of put to the side for our international students. The average grant and scholarship on campus is over $52,000. So I do wanna stress it is an incredibly strong, robust, generous financial aid program. And that regardless of where you come from, for every single admitted student, we meet 100% of their calculated need, okay? When it comes to the academics on campus, we do wanna highlight the fact this number is actually a little bit low. It's 62% of our faculty are women. Um, obviously that means that about 38% are men, right? And so there will be men on campus, but as a women's college, we really wanna highlight what it means to see a whole range of women leaders, um, of women economics professors, of women psychologists, of women neuroscientists, really regardless of what interests you, you can find people who have already studied that field and really look up to them as role models, as mentors, as people who will help guide you through this process and support you for years to come after you graduate. Every single one of our courses is taught by a professor. Um, we do not have graduate students on campus and so you won't have to worry about you know, learning a difficult chemistry course from a 21, 22 year old graduate student. It's always going to be taught by a professor. And when it comes to our class sizes, they're going to be really small. Um, the average class size is about 17 to 20, but it gets significantly smaller as you kind of progress through your time. So by the uh, time you're taking maybe third or fourth year courses, it's not uncommon to have five or six other students in your class with you. Um, over 93% of our classes have less than 30 students. And anytime you're taking a physical science course or any kind of class with a breakout session, those are capped at 20. So again, we want to emphasize that small class size, that intentional community, and the way to kind of really engage with other students. Of course, without graduate students on campus, that means that all of our research is completely handled by our undergraduate students, right? Um, from really your first year onward, you could engage in research. Um, we have our own observatory on campus, as you can see in the top left corner. And I know that a lot of the photos on here look um, like STEM kind of research, but I do wanna emphasize that regardless of your academic interest, it could be art history, it could be sociology, it could be, um, French studies. You can still do research regardless of what you choose to major in. And then of course the eight to one student to faculty ratio again shows just how small the classroom sizes are going to be and how easy it is to engage with professors both inside and outside of class. We do want to highlight the Wellesley effect. Um, so we are considered the world's strongest women's network with 35,000 living alumni living all over um, the world and is of course across the United States as well. 
when it comes to some of our really heavy hitters, um, some of these names likely are jumping out to you, right? Hillary Clinton and Madeleine Albright are both former secretaries of state for the United States. Um, Diane Sawyer is an incredibly famous and successful uh, television journalist. But my personal favorite is actually Vivian Penn. Um, she was the first African-American woman to attend medical school at the University of Virginia. And she went on to revolutionize women's health um, at the National Institutes of Health when she worked there for years outside DC. And so we like to highlight these alumni not only because of their names, but because I think they're indicative of what Wellesley women do, right? They make a difference in the world. They go on to open doors, to break down barriers, to shatter glass ceilings, and then immediately turn around and say, what can I do to support current students? What can I do to support my fellow sisters? And kind of as we alluded to earlier, that does not necessarily mean only Wellesley alums. It means really anyone who went to a women's college. Um, we are considered siblings at this point. And so um, if you go to Smith, if you go to Bryn Mawr, if you go to Scripps or Agnes Scott, um, you are considered part of this small community of this tight bond. And so a lot of times women's college graduates will look out for each other. One thing I do like to highlight is our career education model. So our office of career education has been considered one of the strongest in the country. Um, and another thing that's very distinctive about them is the fact that it is a lifelong commitment. So if you are you know, graduating and you work with Career Ed, of course, to get that first job, that's great. But maybe five, 10 years down the road, you realize, I don't actually want to work as an engineer. I think I want to go to law school. By all means, feel free to reach out and they will set up an appointment with you and walk you through that process. If you're um, not really sure how to ask for a raise or if you need other support when it comes to your career advancement, you can do it for decades after you graduate. It is not just a four year commitment. At this point though, I wanna switch things over to Jen and have her present a little bit on Bryn Mawr. Okay, unmute, and there I am with my beautiful picture in the background. Um, so yeah, so Bryn Mawr College um, is, we are right outside of the city of Philadelphia. Um, so maybe 20 minutes by train outside of Philadelphia. And if you know your geography, Philadelphia is right in between Washington DC and New York City. Um, so we're literally right in between. So there's a lot going on um, in that corridor. And, and especially for international families that may have um, friends or family in either of those places, New York or DC, they're really accessible. Um, about 22% of our students are um, international. So it's a really high percentage of students coming from all over and certainly from Pakistan. Um, let's see. The other thing I wanted to highlight, even we are a women's college, as, as uh, Jake mentioned. Um, but we also um, have a cross registration with uh, four, three other colleges. So we're part of a consortium of four colleges. That includes Bryn Mawr College, Haverford College, Swarthmore College, and the University of Pennsylvania. So I highlight that because there may be um, some men listening into this, uh, this presentation and Bryn Mawr is gonna sound awesome, um, but we can't enroll you, however, um, especially with Haverford College, which is co-ed, there are hundreds of students from Bryn Mawr at Haverford every day and vice versa. So students are taking classes, they're eating in the dining hall, they're participating in all sorts of sports and activities. activities. Um, and so you will see men at Bryn Mawr. Um, but I think what students find is it's not it's not about the absence of men, it's about the presence of women. So that's sort of how, how we think about it. Next slide. Uh, just a couple of highlights um, academically, give you a little bit of um, stats about us. So we have about 13, a little over 1300 students on campus. Um, and again, coming from all over the world, studying all sorts of academic subjects. Um, about, as you can see there, about two, two and a half times uh, the national average of degrees awarded to women in STEM. So what does that mean? Of course you can do a STEM subject at a co-ed college, um, but at Bryn Mawr, about a third of our students major in math or science, which means that 
one out of three of your female friends are also studying math or science. And that's what's different at Bryn Mawr in a women's college than might be at a co-ed institution. So just sort of to think about sort of what that, um, who your peers are um, is, is, is really important. Um, I would say some of our larger majors, um, biology, math, psychology, international studies, economics, um, are all a lot of very big majors, but we have a lot of smaller majors that are really interesting as well. And students do double major and major and minor in combinations of, of things as well. So that's to highlight. Uh, next slide. And then this is just to give you a little bit of an idea of the various paths that students have taken and who some of our students are. Um, so in the top right there, that's Haley. And she was one of our super STEM students. Uh, she um, majored in math and chemistry and did a lot of research with faculty um, during her time at Bryn Mawr. So that's, that's something that students really can do even after their very first year, they can do research with faculty. Um, and she, when she graduated, she ended up um, as a Fulbright scholar in Germany. So that's what she, and she was up to. Uh, and then just below her, I'm going to highlight Joy, um, who is a student from Zimbabwe. And she knew kind of right away that she was interested in business. Um, and she found a way, a path to do business at Bryn Mawr. And she had her double meet, or she, let's see, international studies and African studies. Um, and she also took a lot of economics courses. So she combined all of those things. And she really delved into the internships available at Bryn Mawr. Um, and so she was able to do several internships with BlackRock, which is a financial advising company firm um, in New York City. And so she spent several summers there doing internships with them. Um, and now that's where she works. So she, she graduated and got a full-time job with BlackRock. Um, and she's doing all sorts of other things, interesting things as well, but, uh, but just, you know, very diverse kinds of students, interests, and, and different paths that they've taken. Next slide. So this little collage, uh, just, I'm going to sort of zero in on the sense of community. And we talked about that a lot earlier in this presentation about liberal arts and sciences colleges. Um, but a couple of things I think that are really unique to Bryn Mawr and, and our community in particular, um, <laughs> excuse me, um, is our, our traditions. We have a number of traditions during on campus and some are silly, some are serious, some are secret, um, but they bring students together in a way that I've never seen before. Um, so in the, there's a picture, it's a little hard to see, but um, a student holding a green lantern, a green light there, um, that's our lantern night. And so students, all students get that lantern, a physical lantern that you keep for the rest of your life. And um, so there are uh, lanterns literally all over the world because alums take them uh, with them. Um, it is the light of knowledge being passed on to the first year students from the upper class students. So it's just a, a really cool ceremony and, and a real tangible piece of Bryn Mawr that, that you have literally for the rest of your life and that you're, you're sharing with your, your peers. Um, we have a, an honor code, which is also really unique and informs the character of the college. Um, so this means that as you might think in no cheating, no plagiarizing, you know, our students academically, very high level of integrity. Um, but there's also social aspects to it. Um, you know, you really take on a lot of responsibility, you know, for yourself and you kind of address issues as they come up and students listen to one another along those lines. Uh, we also have self-scheduled exams. Um, so what that means is at the end of the semester, there's not a particular day that you take your exam. Um, our students have a whole week and you decide when you're taking your exam. Uh, you wake up in the morning and you thought you were ready to take your biology exam, but nope, not ready. And you can put it off until the next day. 
And everybody in that biology class is taking the same exam, but on different days, different times. Um, and Haverford College has the same system um, because we have so many students cross registering. So they also have an honor code and, and we collaborate there so that our finals sort of sync with each other. Um, so lots of other, you know, it, unique things to, to Bryn Mawr and our campus community. Um, but I'll, I'll end with one more slide. Um, and with one of my favorite quotes that um, from one of our alums, uh, that Bryn Mawr is a place where you can come as you are and grow into what you want to be. And that just really um, resonates, I think, with a lot, with a lot of our students. Um, I've highlighted a few ways um, of what our students are doing after graduation, because obviously we all want to know that. Um, and so what I think particularly interesting is the top industry fields that you'll see there. So business is the first one. Um, we don't have a business major, but it is one of the top fields that our students are going into. And I highlight this because I think it says a world about liberal arts and sciences colleges and what you can pursue and what opportunities there are for you. Um, and obviously you can see the other kinds of fields that our students are very strongly involved in as well. Um, so hopefully this has given you a little uh, peek at Bryn Mawr College. And I think we are going to do some questions and answers. So thanks for your patience and listening to us. And uh, we'll go from there. Okay, thank you so much to all of our panelists for your, uh, for your extremely informative presentation. Uh, I'll just begin with the Q&A. One small note about the questions and answers. Uh, since it started coming in early, I've been dismissing a few questions as they come if I feel like the presentation uh, has already addressed them to the full to avoid a repetition of information. So the first question we have here is from Hassan Kayani regarding uh, MBBS and nursing programs. Um, I just, again, to all of our listeners, I'd like to reiterate uh, or just to uh, just to let you know, there is no undergraduate medical degree available in the U.S. There is no MBBS equivalent. Um, medicine, like law, only exists as a terminal degree. But I do think this brings up an interesting uh, question about what do, what does the path to medicine look like at a liberal arts college? Um, who, well, who's going to take that? One? I'll I'll take it. Yeah, if you want to take it, and then I might, I did add some about my, the health sciences major. Okay, well. yeah. And yeah. so I think what I said on that is it's comprehensive, it, you know, these programs prepare you for all of the kind of skills and disciplines you may need to apply for medical school, whether it would be a pre-med, you know, a pre-vet nursing, you know, public health, you could go right into public health through this program. So I think for, at least for us at Wells, rather than being a very specific, like pre-med, you're going to be a doctor type of program, it's a comprehensive health sciences program, which gives you a wide variety of professional experience, research experience, um, and mentorship that could get you into whichever of the medical disciplines you would like to pursue for graduate school. So that's how we approach it. And I think we have a, have a similar approach too. You mentioned public health. A lot of st our students in particular are interested in public health. So really blending um, social sciences as well with yes. sciences. Um, so lots of paths. Yeah, you don't even have to study a science to go into medical school in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, really they're looking for more social sciences and humanities students at this point. Um, so uh, you'll be surrounded by a lot of strong support, um, professional staff that can guide you through the process. Our students go on to top medical schools in droves. So. Thank you so much. Um, so Sarah Ghani asks, if a college has a liberal arts program, but the subject we want to major in isn't listed as a part of that program, does that mean that the liberal arts uh, uh, program at that college is inappropriate for their interest or they shouldn't apply uh, in? 
Not necessarily, like Jen just referenced, right? A lot of liberal arts colleges do not offer business per se as an undergraduate major. Um, but at Wellesley, for um, an example, our top major by far is economics. And they go on into the business and kind of uh, counting finance worlds um, in huge numbers every single year. So I think shifting what you expect as a major is really important at a liberal arts college. Um, several will actually allow you to create an interdisciplinary major, but the United States and especially liberal arts colleges, it, it, your career path and your future is not as wedded to your undergraduate major as many people think it is. It's more about, as Charlie said, learning those soft skills that transfer between careers. Um, you again like as someone who has a lot of friends who are attorneys most of them were not studying history or government in undergraduate some of them are even studying things like chemistry and so if you have the skills and you have the knowledge and the ability especially coming from a liberal arts college you can go on to do really whatever you want and so i would not eliminate schools based off of a preconceived notion of what a major should look like or even what it should be named sometimes students um, get a little bit distracted because they expect a certain name like international relations, which we don't offer as its own department at Wellesley, it is housed within political science, right? And so if you look at a list and don't see IR listed, you'd walk away not knowing that we have one of the strongest programs in the country for poli sci, and that we could absolutely help you um, on your path to working in international law or international relations. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, so the next question is, uh, Given the flexibility that is inherent in a liberal arts uh, curriculum, are there compulsory subjects or are there uh, requirements for a degree? I could take that um, okay. because I think it truly depends on the school, right? Mm -hmm. um, Smith and Amherst are open curriculum schools where you don't really have any requirements uh, per se in terms of a set list of classes. Um, one of our more famous core curriculum schools is St. John's, uh, where everyone has to read a list of books, literally, um, and you can't graduate without fulfilling those requirements. I think our schools are likely going to be pretty similar with distribution requirements, where you have certain academic disciplines where you're expected to take courses, but you choose what classes fulfill those requirements. So exactly. as an example, if you have to take a science class, you could choose physics or astronomy or environmental science or biology. It's really kind of up to you how to fulfill those course requirements. Mm -hmm. And so you still have a lot of autonomy and agency in terms of shaping your own experience. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the next question we have here is from OS, who's asking, since A-levels are a common education system in Asia, mm -hmm. do you think an A-level student um, is well-equipped to study the liberal arts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I think we're all nodding our heads. Yes. <laughs> um, and I think because we have, you know, such a diversity of students, we're very mm -hmm. familiar with A levels and other curricula as well um, from around the world. And, you know, as we were just talking about, I think A levels is a really good example. I often get the question, you know, I did the I did a business social science stream for my A-levels. I didn't take math. Can I still pursue pre-med or can I still mm -hmm. do some other, you know, sort of math or science kind of subject as a degree, even though I didn't take those as my A-level subjects? Yes. <laughs> so as, just, as we were- That's true talking, for us too. Um, is we are going to look mm -hmm. at you, your whole person, what subjects that you studied, um, but your ability, not just your, your knowledge in a particular subject, but your, your ability. And fear mm -hmm. not, we think you're qualified and we admit you, we think you can do our work in any subject. Yes. And, and I'm not sure about the other two schools, but uh, do you waive uh, the English language proficiency testing TOEFL IELTS uh, for A-level students? Do you waive that requirement? If, if, if it's, yes, um, English language um, medium school. So that's- okay. Yeah, same for us. So you wouldn't have to submit, that would just be another added benefit of yeah. A-level student. You wouldn't have to submit the IELTS or TOEFL for us. Yeah. And we also give substantial credit for A-levels yes. as well. We know you've worked hard, so you can get um, credit for the, what you've done. 
Um, okay, great. So the next question we have here uh, is in regards to um, the the uh, the kind of the stature that a liberal arts undergraduate degree has uh, when applying to a grad school in the U.S. Are there benefits or uh, costs to having that? Is there a different a differential in the way that is evaluated? I don't believe so. I think, you know, regardless of what it is you want to study, whether you go to a liberal arts college or a large public flagship or a private research university, really what they're looking um, for is how do you express yourself? How do you articulate yourself? And what skills have you learned regardless of your major, right? So again, kind of going back to the law school um, example, you can study really whatever you want. As long as you do well and you're excited about those courses, they're going to be excited about you as an applicant. Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, it doesn't really matter per se where you go to undergraduate as long as you really um, kind of take everything you can out of that experience, whether that's internships, whether it's research, whether it's study abroad or maybe all of the above. Yes really kind of soak up all that that school has to offer and the resources that they can give you. And that I think is really going to make the difference once you apply to graduate school, not necessarily the fact that you went to a liberal arts college versus mm -hmm. a research university. Because again, you can do research at a liberal arts college. You can do basically everything yes. you could do at a research university at a liberal arts college in a much smaller um, kind mm -hmm. of pensional community. And I just wanted to add a little bit onto that, that uh, I think because there, it's a small, you know, we're small liberal arts colleges focused on undergraduate. It actually provides you a lot more opportunity to exactly. fill out your resume with really impressive um, different activities, including professional level research right alongside faculty. You know, Jennifer mentioned you could do that after first year. It's same for, for Wells. We have sophomores who are doing um, professional level research in, in genetics and in different work. Um, and even though for a school like Wells, even though we're more of a middle ranked uh, liberal arts college, we're sending students into graduate programs at Ivy League every year. Um, and we're, we've had students fully funded um, quite frequently for PhD programs at, at top research universities. Uh, and a big part of that is because they have very close connections with their faculty. So they're getting incredible letters of recommendation and leveraging those connections. Uh, many of them have gone to professional conferences where they're meeting you know, the potential future interviewers or, or employers. Um, and they also have that research experience. So in addition to top grades, you get all this other, all these other pieces that can help you, uh, help, help set you apart on those grad school applications. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so the next question we have is whether or not uh, students can expect their specific dietary needs to be met on your campuses, such as halal, vegan, kosher, et cetera. Of course, yes. We actually have our own um, vegan, vegetarian, and kosher dining hall on campus. But even if you don't want to trek all the way over to Pomeroy, you can always um, kind of just look at the menu and it'll be designated as to what is vegan, what is halal, what's kosher, yes. et cetera. Or you can always walk up to someone and ask for something to be made. And I imagine that's the same for all three of our schools. Yeah, that's definitely true. Well, it's probably just because of our size has um, probably more limited uh, selection, but we definitely have everything labeled. We have vegan, vegetarian, halal options every day. Um, and then I also mentioned that we do shuttles into Ithaca that stop at Asian markets and, and have um, have cooking facilities in the dorms too. So if you get tired of what's in the dining hall, there's opportunities to you know make your favorite home cooked meal. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a question about uh, from from Mohammed Khan uh, asking what you anticipate to be the impact on international admissions uh, of the current pandemic, if any. It's a big question, That's the question right? It's a big question. <laughs> yeah, there's been a hundred webinars just about that. In the last yeah. Right. Um, I, I, we don't know. <laughs> I wish you know. I, I wish we did. Um, I suspect that there'll be some kind of implications, but we just don't know what that's going to look like. Um, so the one thing I can say is that we are doing this webinar <laughs> because we think, we hope, and we want international students to continue to come to our colleges. Yep. So please know that. Yeah. That's, that's what I was going to say. We're, we are 100% committed to supporting our international students and recruiting more 
amazing international students um, throughout you know, the, this difficult time, but there, there probably are going to be drops and just as, as mobility of students as far as travel and visas um, is, is hampered by this, there's gonna be drops in international student population. Uh, at least for for this year. So I mean, I'm in at least for myself. I'm anticipating and already talking to some students about deferring to the spring semester just to ensure that they can um, have enough time to qualify for the visa and plan the travel safely. Yeah. Right. So on a on a, a related note, we have a question here asking if there would be an adjustment in fees if uh, classes have to be taken online. Um, for international students especially, but also for domestic students, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously we would not charge you room and board because you're not living on campus. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I think these are the questions that our schools are all still struggling with and trying to exactly. determine what our plan is, not only for the next academic year, but for the next maybe two or three, because like, no one knows in the world how long this pandemic will mm -hmm. last. We are all kind of learning and kind of um, adjusting as it happens, it's much like you. Um, but I, I can say that I would doubt most schools would charge any kind of room and board because you're not living on campus, you're not eating in the dining halls and using the meal plan. And so there's at least that reduction, but I'm not able to say, you know, individual schools may change their tuition rates or anything like that, but room and board, I would imagine, would not be part of your fee structure. Okay, thank you. Um, so, oh, I'm just going to... Right, the next question we have here, um, and I'm just gonna do one or two more questions and then I let our panelists mm -hmm. go. Um, so the question is from Kirat Fatima, who's asking, with the recent test optional policy adopted by several US colleges, will a student who is choosing to not submit an SAT score be disadvantaged in comparison with mm -hmm. someone who does? No. I can take that. I don't know about our, our colleagues, but we have, we are one of those schools that is utilizing a test optional policy for the coming year. Uh, and the reason that we are saying optional is because it is optional. A lot of times yes. students think that optional or recommended means do it anyway. It's like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And we cannot stress enough that when we say something is optional, you will not and cannot be penalized for not submitting that material. Um, we will utilize mm -hmm. the rest of your application through the holistic review process to determine if you're a fit. Um, but if you decide not to submit testing or if you're unable to actually uh, test with SAT or ACT, again, we understand that this year is obviously very, very different from years past. Um, yes. And we're going to utilize um, kind of the time that we have um, to understand those circumstances and to, again, not penalize students as a result. Exactly. Yeah, we, we, do, we don't have it as part of our scholarship model at all. So it's just, it's just a little bonus if you want to submit it. Um, sometimes the, the, the only place that I've seen it useful in admissions for, for us as test optional is if you had some struggles in your academic record and then tested very well. Yeah. So if you, you know, if you had some C's or lower grades in the in your semesters um, and then got a 700 on the English for SAT, you know, then that could balance out. But uh, yeah, so, so that's the only scenario that I would say um, where I see it really benefiting. Okay, thank you. Um, the, so th this is the penultimate question. Is a comparative liberal arts study CLS the same as li a liberal arts program? Hmm. I can't answer that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what that, I don't know if, if that's a meeting. Is that, is that the more like a certificate program at another institution? Can you kind of give us a little bit more context for that? Uh, yeah, if uh, the person who asked that question, if you can just uh, elaborate a little bit and we'll see if we can get to that. And then this is the last question I have, which I think is pretty funny. Um, this is from Sarah Ghani again, who's asking, why would someone not want to go to a liberal arts college? <laughs> not someone who did attend a liberal arts college. Sarah, I don't know, but to, to mm -hmm. our panelists. That is, that is a good question. Great um, question, yeah. In fact, um, I think if you prefer large lectures um, that you're a little more, or maybe a lot more passive in um, your studies, that might be a reason not to go mm -hmm. to a, a liberal arts college. Um, if you're looking for a stadium of 
tens of thousands of students cheering their American football team. Yes. And probably not the good match for a liberal arts college. Yeah. I think that there's I a pretty agree. big cultural difference as far as like, you know, not, not nationality, like culture, but uh, like my, my brother wanted to attend a university where many of his friends from high school were attending, um, where there was large division one athletics, or you could go see a football game, you can go, um, you know, they bring in big concerts and all of this. Uh, so he wanted the whole university campus kind of feel, so attended the University of New Hampshire. Um, but I don't know, from an academic standpoint, I can't think of <laughs> that many. <laughs> I attended liberal arts schools as well. Yeah, I mean, I did, I did not attend a liberal arts college, but I attended a university with a liberal arts model. Um, I chose to go there for very different reasons, but coming from um, Texas at my last job, mm -hmm. the culture there very much is going to huge state schools. You know, 30, 40, even 50,000 students on campus, they want to be part of that family, of that community. They want to be a member of Aggie Nation or, you know, UT Austin and, and kind of wear those colors. Um, and some of it's sports, but some of it's the network, some of it's, you know, engaging with alumni. So there are plenty of great reasons for students to attend schools that aren't liberal arts colleges. Um, but from the three of us, I think we would all kind of push you to really consider a liberal arts college because it is so different and so um, individualized in terms of what you can experience as a student. Okay, so we're well past the hour mark here. Uh, thank you to our attendees for all of your engagement and your questions uh, here and on Facebook as well. Um, thank you so much to uh, Charles, Jake, and Jennifer for putting together this thank presentation you. and for your time. Uh, and I, I know, Jennifer, you have a thing to share uh, to our uh, remaining participants. So please go ahead. And again, once again, thank you so much for your yeah. uh, accommodation in terms of timing and everything. Of yeah, just wanted to mention that we hope this is just the beginning of your college search. Um, we hope that you're interested in what you heard about our colleges today in particular, um, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, so you can go to our individual websites, um, or there's also a link on Facebook um, that Education USA has posted, and we'll just collect, we'll, it's a super easy, quick form, and we can get your information and then be in contact with you. So um, we know there are a lot of, of people viewing and we just want to know who you are. I just dropped the, uh, the link to the Wells International Students page as well as uh, my WhatsApp number into the chat. So well, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks everyone for coming. Cool. Have a good one, bye.